how we do this, we are the truest, got these fangs super sharp, your shit toothless, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish, in the graveyard, acting foolish, finna dance with the devil to no music, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish. If you can heal my voice, that's because you've hit play on a podcast. And that podcast is called Ghoulish. And I am Max Booth, an undead host. On today's episode of the podcast, I am talking to a really good friend of mine named Shane Patrick Phil. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. He has three goddamn names. And he's on the podcast today talking about editing spooky movies because he was the editor of a movie I wrote called We Need to Do Something. It just came out like two weeks ago as of the time that I am recording this intro. And the, Now, the conversation itself, I recorded with Shane like a month before the movie came out. The movie came out September 3rd, 2021, in case you might be listening to this episode 10 years from now. In which case, holy shit, there's still podcasts t- 10 years from 2021? I, I refuse to believe it. There's no way this is going to be a sustaining uh, way to entertain people. It's going to go away. It's absolutely going to go away. What are we going to have after podcasts? I don't know. Probably a nuclear holocaust, perhaps? It, sound, it sounds like that's real... The universe is probably going to head. I don't know. I'm no... I'm no a futurist. I don't tell the future. I'm just speaking into a mic. No one's around to listen to me. No one's around to say, hey, Max, maybe you don't make any sense right now. Hey, Max, why don't you get on the fucking topic? I guess I guess that's me as well. I, I'm telling myself that. Okay. If you hear chewing in the background, it's because I have a dog. We just got a new puppy. His name is Frank. Frank Booth. He, uh, named after Dennis Hopple from Blue Velvet. And much like that kill my dog will fuck anything that moves because he has not been noodled yet. But eventually, he will be. But not yet. Anyway, I know I, ha- I know I haven't talked about it whatsoever in the past few weeks, but yes. Calm down. I wrote a movie. It's called We Need to Do Something. It's about a family stuck in a bathroom. Terrible premise. Pretty okay movie? I think so. I met Shane while on set of this movie. We instantly clicked. I walked into the editing room. I had my Nine Inch Nails baseball cap on. He saw that. We connected immediately. And now we're all best friends. We are now in a uh, middle suicide pact if uh, neither of us, you know, are married (laughs) for a certain age. We will... We will rent a motel room and kill ourselves, and it will be romantic. (laughs) I got Shane on the podcast to talk about what it takes to do post-production on a whole movie. We got to talk about our experience with We Need to Do Something, because not only was this the first uh, movie I wrote, this was the first movie Shane edited, too. He he runs a post-op... Post-op? No, a post-production company called Hiatus. But he's mostly done, like, documentaries and Camille Schultz, but We Need to Do Something was his debut movie that he edited. And it's awesome. I'm I'm so glad, like, we both connected this way. I hope we have a long career ahead of us. I write spooky things, maybe I direct them, and he edits them, and we just find excuses to keep hanging out. That's my hope. I also hope you check out the movie. We need to do something. You can rent it at the places you rent movies. Amazon Prime, iTunes, Apple TV, YouTube, Voodoo, all these (laughs) childish sounding names. You can go to them and rent the movie. I don't think it's playing in theaters anywhere else at this point. Not that it played in many to begin with, but I... (laughs) 
IFC isn't listening to this. It's okay. But yeah, go rent it. Check it out. Let me, don't let me know what you think. I, I, I don't want to know. I've seen enough reviews at this point. Well, I no longer want to know what anyone thinks about this movie. I, we made it. I hope it makes some money because I, I get a percentage of profit. And that would be nice because I am going broke. Speaking of, I have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. I also sell books. I, I run a spooky publishing company called Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Go on over to perpetualpublishing.com, buy any of those books. If you're interested in We Need to Do Something, we just did a new edition. You buy a signed copy at that website. There's also a limited edition held cover of We Need to, we Need to Do Something that includes the screenplay. I'm sick of saying the title of this book and movie. It's too long. Someone should have stopped me. Which is funny because many people did try to stop me. They, tr they tried to say, hey, Max, <laughs> you, you need a different title. And I said, absolutely no way in hell. And I won. I, amazingly, I won that argument. And now I have to keep saying, we need to do something. And now my dog is eating my belt. So I'm going to end this intro. And get on with my conversation with Shane Patrick Fuld. Oh, and by the way, just one quick note. I I forget at this point what the fuck we talked about since it's been like over a month. But I have to assume we spoiled the movie a bit. I would recommend watching it before listening to this episode. Okay, thank you. Let's listen to the episode. We met each other, like, we, we met during the filming of this movie. We we hadn't talked at all, like, on via email or anything. I didn't even know your name until I, the day I met you. What, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, you know, going into this thing, so I was excited to even meet the writer of this thing and knowing that you were coming to the set and coming to production and then actually staying the whole time. I was just like so, so fucking excited. And um, and I think even funny enough, we didn't even, I feel like we didn't even meet each other until like at least a few days in. I think it was definitely the first week of production. But I think at a certain point, I don't know if I'd asked Sean or whatever, and um, or it had just come up where it was like, oh, that's Max. I was like, oh, cool. And I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like pretty quickly you and I like connected right away and we're like, oh, okay, this is my people. <laughs> like we instantly hit it off and that's where I felt so much safer. I think doing my job for a couple of reasons, the fact that we honestly, I think you were wearing like a nine inch nails hat and I was like, okay, um, <laughs> nine inch nails, Trent Reznor being one of my favorite like artists of all time. I was like, okay, cool, easy, ease into this. But then even even just quickly after like talking with you and the, the connections that we had about like tastes and comedy and a horror. Um, but then beyond all of that, the fact that this was our first film together, I think we felt safe in that. We were confident in our abilities and what we were doing and our inspirations and references and everything that we were bringing to the table. But again, it was still brand new to us. And we were able to kind of like explore that together um, and kind of like, I guess, traverse the, the, the waters of making a, an indie horror film together. And, and to that, I will say, we didn't know what we were doing, but we were just um, having fun. And I, I think that that was amazing kind of meeting on set. Yeah, I think I, I think it was maybe like day three of of me being on set, which would have been I think day full of filming, because we had a delay. But um, I re I remember I was like I was hanging out on set for one or two days, and the way the set was built, it wasn't like the best set to be like a no. like a background witness on, <laughs> because I mean you go there's to, no room. Yeah, like yeah. the way I would describe it, and maybe you have a better perspective on it, is it's a it's a tiny garage that someone has built a bathroom into and 
you can't really look into the bathroom unless you were on one specific side of it and everybody else is kind of cramped into these like skinny dunk uh essentially <laughs> hallways with yeah. cameras and you have like crew running around saying get and out of my it, way get out of my way and and you don't feel like you're allowed to be there right <laughs> yeah i was afraid i was gonna just break anything at any time and plus i mean this goes without saying but i'm gonna say it anyway uh it was it was in 2020 we will we still all kind of uh, dealing with COVID yeah. and we had lots of safety uh, re- uh, precautions going on. We right. Had, we had to have for the majority of the set, we had to have not only a mask, but also a face mask. And it wasn't until like the end of set that someone from, um, I don't know, some movie safety person came to visit and she was like, Oh, if you have glasses, you don't need a face mask on. And I was like, what? No one told me this. Yeah. You had like triple protection, but no, <laughs> you're totally right. I, I think, um, I think added yeah add that complexity already of like a tiny set with a ton of moving parts and people, but then the fact that you go down there and especially for me as an editor on set like that's I mean that that happens but it's not like always uh, a situation right so I I'm always kind of like very protective of um, where I'm standing and all those things too it's like and especially during COVID it was like I shouldn't be down here at all whatsoever. But I also think to that point, I think um, obviously I have a little bit of background in production already. And so I'm familiar with sets. And I think after talking with you, this was all still kind of brand new to you as well. And I think um, that was another way that we could connect. And I could, where it's like, hey, you want to get out of here? You want to just go up to the edit room real quick? And you're like, oh my God, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think Sean gaggled that I was really out of my element. He was like, you should meet Shane. And I said, who is your Shane? Anxiety, your anxiety was through the roof on the set. Where I was like, hey, do you want to come to my dark cavernous um, edit theater? And then as soon as you got in there, you're like, oh. Because then it was just you and you and I, right? Exactly. Yeah. Plus, also, I hadn't been in a movie theater in like a year, man. It was so great to just step into this mini one. At at first, I thought maybe I was about to get whacked because I didn't know, I didn't understand (laughs) the layout of the building at all. He he led me into this really dark room with just like you sitting at the top (laughs) of this platform, just feeling behind you, behind you, (laughs) behind me with a gun, (laughs) and the thing. I, I grew to discover about being in that room that we were editing in is if you stay too long, you get kind of a crazy vibe to you. So when I walked in, you will like a guy tripping on coke. And I thought, <laughs> what is happening? But like 20 minutes later, I was also like shilling that vibe because you get stuck yeah. together in this little theater just like watching the same thing. Over I want to clarify, over. though. I want to clarify. I wasn't sitting there doing cocaine. <laughs> I'm going to delete what you just said. Okay, that's why I was like, I wasn't that. But hold on, I I do kind of want to like, if we were to step back, I I do like what you were about to, or what you were saying with like, um, what the edit room feels like. And it isn't a very, it is a very interesting uh, experience. So I think to back up a bit, to give the audience a great little idea of (laughs) what to visualize, why don't you kind of walk them through like what, this building even looked like and what the setup was because as you've as you and i have talked about it's pretty unique the way this was all done it was it it, it was weirdly like perfectly contained as maybe other interviews and the comments um that might come out about like the the making and the production of this film will will also um, show but essentially the set was built on the first floor in kind of like a, a large garage. So we kind of built out a, um, a little sound stage in this garage in this huge office building. And uh, for those that know and for those that don't know, we were up in kind of like about 30 minutes north of downtown Detroit in a city called Southfield. So it's a bunch of office buildings and things like that. So we were in this large office building. The set was on the first floor. And then up on the top floor, the sixth floor, which is perfect. Love the number six for this movie here. Um, On the sixth floor, there was um, Atlas, Atlas Industries office space. And in their office space, they have uh, a great kind of like mini theater screening room where the editorial took place. Um, And then literally 50 feet out the door of that office building was the hotel we were all staying in. So really for the, the three and a half 
almost three and a half weeks, almost month that all of us were there, uh, we, we saw nothing but that parking lot and those two buildings. Um, and so it was, it was a perfectly contained group of people within a box, within a box, within a box, telling a story about people stuck in a box. <laughs> and above us was a broad pit just screaming, what's in the box? Oh, God, what's in the box? <laughs> Right, exactly. That's from a movie called a Eight. But the funny thing is, is like literally for me, I would I would just be going up and down that elevator, which you obviously did as well, and a, and a handful of the crew did. But we would just be going up and down that elevator from the set to six, from one to six, from one to six. Walk over to the hotel, go up in an elevator to your room, come back down, go over, go up, go down. <laughs> so we were just kind of like just, just trapped. It was, I mean, to, to give the audience an idea of how close we were to the hotel, like at one point we were going to do a group photo and they told us and both of us were kind of panicking like, oh shit, do we look okay? And we each like called <laughs> someone else like, hey, what should I wheel doing this? And then we just walked and changed and came back without yes. breaking a sweat. Yes, it was that easy. <laughs> that was a, that was I always found it funny that both of us at the same time kind of like, oh shit, what are we, is this? All these clothes okay? But that was that was, and that was. A, I, I will say this. I will add to that from for the standpoint of the giddiness, I think, and the excitement that you and I both had had about working on our our first movie and a horror movie, and during October, like all of the things that lined up for this are. are I mean, I just feel so fortunate to have been a part of this whole process and team where it's like literally everything I've ever wanted to do, it all was happening. And it was during it, I knew it was crazy. And looking back on it now, it's still the exact same crazy to me of like how amazing it was. So I remember like how, how important the group photo was for you and I, and that's why we cared so much about like, Oh my God. Oh my God. What am I going to wear? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was great. Oh. Have I you, wonder when that group photo will ever come out. It's I not. Know, maybe it, it'll it can't. Never come out. The group photo. It can't. Can, it really, truly can't yeah. until like maybe 10 years from now. <laughs> and the reason why is uh, it contains a, a massive spoiler to like the ending of the movie. And no one really Literally, thought. Yeah. No one really thought about it yeah. at the time. Um, you and I, we did though. You did and we, I did know that. We're like, I do remember all of the photos and things that were coming out sometimes about like, them taking photos of this spoiler that I'm not going to mention. Yeah. It was weird. Be like, isn't that a spoiler? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean the thing that uh, was originally in the fucking yes. trailer? Um, exactly. Um, <laughs> that photo I do have framed in my house. It's a great photo. Oh, um, you do? Yeah, it's amazing. I do. I, yeah, I can't wait to get the the poster framed, and I'll probably do all that stuff as well, like with the group shot and things like that. So, have you always? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but you've always had like an interest in this genre, right? Absolutely. So, my my love for horror, and you know, I, I feel like it's really always been a part of my life. Uh, my my family, and like I was raised in a in a household where movies were always a, a big part of kind of like the weekend family experience in a way, right? I'm, I'm from the era, go to Blockbuster with my dad and brother, grab four or five movies and plow through them over the weekend. Um, I give a lot of credit to my parents for always kind of just like, never really, uh, I guess, protecting us from movies like we were always allowed to watch rated r movies and things like that and 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 not in a weird way but it was like they were open and they it was just like we were totally fine we were watching rated r movies when we were young but it was um it, it wasn't a big deal and then i would say the horror movie aspect for me came from my aunt and uh, my aunt jody who is no longer with us and i will say this a huge part of this entire process for me, she was always on my mind. And even my family said that several times, like, you know, your aunt Jody would love this right now. I was like, believe me, I know. Um, so when I, when I was young and I would stay over my aunt Jody's house, um, she didn't have any kids. So like we were treated like grandkids, like they, they were like our grandparents essentially. And, um, because if she never had any kids, she didn't have any filter of the movies and she was in <laughs> huge, huge horror buff. Even down to the standpoint where, like, she loved playing Resident Evil on PlayStation. Oh, so, wow. like, 
Um, I know. And so like when we were as young as I can remember, um, she, she would be renting or some of my earliest memories of, of her renting like the prophecy with Christopher Walken yeah. or like <laughs> just shit like that. Oh, Hellraiser. And, um, but then a, a, I, I will never forget that, um, the exorcist, um, they, they brought that back to theaters, whatever it was, maybe it was like the 25th anniversary of it or something. And whatever age I was at, <laughs> we, we went to the theater to see the exorcist and that I would say that was the one that always stuck out to me where it was like, I was never scared. It was never like, it was never a big deal to me about like anything spooky or horror related. It was always like a roller coaster. It was a ride. It was an experience. It was ups and downs, the jumps and all of the music and everything about it to me, like, yes, I love all horror or I love all movie genres, but to me, the horror experience was always the most fun because it could, it could, it could ride the line of being serious and, um, but it could also jump over to a, a side of it where it's like, we don't give a fuck. Like we're just here. <laughs> we're just here to get a rise out of you or to have some fun. Like it's entertainment. And I think through the horror genre, it taught me that movies can be entertaining just to be entertaining and you can have some fucking fun with it. You know, it's it's interesting. You and I, we haven't really discussed like old childhoods together. And like, I, I would consider you a friend. I know you would consider me an acquaintance. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but, uh, um, um, You're a friend. I had a similar uh, childhood. Like my parents didn't have any censorship about what I watched. I, I recall right. like, like my favorite movie that my mom and I would watch a lot was True Romance. <laughs> and, <laughs> Great. Yeah, and but I, I also had an aunt who was not like a, re- a blood relative aunt, but like my mom's best friend. That I just always called my aunt, and um, she also was like big into the genre, and she would like she would find movies that she thought I would like and rip like download them off a of line I love it. and just rip Amazing. me these DVDs and every time I would visit she would have like a new booklet of DVDs like you gotta take these home and watch them <laughs> that's amazing yeah I I, uh, I I feel very fortunate to have that or not fortunate however maybe it fucked me up but <laughs> but no I, I don't think so because I, I feel like the the awareness um, like again, I, yeah, my, my, my family never censored us. And I think that's why, like, um, and I don't think people should be censored, especially just from entertainment and movies and things like that and video games and shit. If you know how to raise your fucking family and your kids, like they're going to be fine. They're going to grow up fine. They can watch horror movies and it's not like we turned out into serial murderers or anything, you know, like it was, I knew it was entertainment and it was funny. It was funny. Um, and, or scary. And then we, but it was fun to put a pillow in front of your face and peek around it. Right. Like that was, that's the whole point. Did they make you a uh, black eyes at nudity? Oh, of course. Yeah. Anytime boobs showed up, cover your, cover your eyes, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> I know you just watched this guy get his his throat ripped, but you don't look yeah, at his right? boobs. What is the difference of that? <laughs> what is that shit? That's so funny you said that. Yeah, that was totally the only thing. Like sometimes my mom, like um, like watching like a Pulp Fiction or something, anything with Samuel L. Jackson, right? Like swearing, swearing, they didn't care that much about. But at a certain point, once there were like a, a couple hundred f bombs, they'd be like, "Okay, we're sorry." I'm like, "What do you mean you're sorry?" I'm like. I don't know. I don't know what's going on right now. <laughs> I I remember like the a movie we watched a lot in retrospect. I don't know why they kept playing this because I had to keep my eyes covered. Half the goddamn movie was from Dust Till Dawn. Oh man, the whole half yeah. of that movie is at a strip club. I didn't even know like yeah. vampires were involved for the longest time. That movie's awesome. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Like, when I think about, like, when I used to watch movies as a kid and how, like, uh, eventually I began having an interest in how they were made and I would, like, watch all the -the behind-the-scenes shit. I would, like, go obsessive over Fangoria magazine and all that. The Mm -hmm. The one subject of filmmaking I never gave a lot of thought to until, I guess, within the last couple of years was, like, the editing of the movie. And now I kind of understand that might be the one of the most essential bits of making a movie good. And I'm just curious because this is what you do for a living. At what point did you begin watching movies and 
begin to have that interest of like, okay, how are they piecing this movie together? You know, the thing, you know, I get asked this a lot. People are like, why the hell did you choose to be an editor? Um, um, because people that don't do it, or even people that know about it, like, and, and like directors and a lot of people that I've worked with, it's like, man, I could never fucking do that. But it is, it is kind of this, like, I guess, kind of black art, dark art, secret art form in the sense of like, uh, I, I came to really respect, to really, truly respect it. Um, and I mean, it's said, uh, the, the movies are written three times, right? The script, on production, and then in editorial. And I think for me, um, my background is I'm a musician. I've, I've been playing piano since I was a kid, six, seven, eight years old, all the way up through, through high school, early college. Um, and my instrument of choice was piano. I also played drums, but I, I always attribute my, my music background to the transfer into my passion for editorial, because I think there's a lot of crossover there um, in terms of pacing, feeling, emotion, and a lot of that with my hands. Uh, I think for me, I look at also editorial as almost like you're painting a picture but with this visual art form and the way things are put together for, for instance, like a dialogue scene, um, there are a million ways to put any scene together. Any editor is going to look at it in, a, in, in their own perspective, in their own way and take that footage and piece that thing together in their own way. And I, I love that. But I also think there, and there's never a right, right way to do it. I think it's whatever way they want to do it. But I think that's what I love about it, like the ebb and flow of like pace of uh, just energy, emotion, sensitivities to things. Um, my background, like I, I think for me, too, it's like I have a lot of background in commercial production, kind of like some short films, music videos and things like that. But not, not that much in long form. But that background, I think, helped taught me, like kind of teach me a lot of lessons in the way of experience. And for me, it's like, uh, I, I run my own post house and I have other editors and I love developing new talent. And one of the things that I always tell, um, other editors, junior editors, assistant editors, anybody that asks me questions like, how do you do what you do? Or how do you get into what you do? Literally for me, editorial is life experience. Because at the end of the day, I'm sitting behind a computer, I'm pushing buttons, I'm moving clips around in, in software these days, right? I know we could sit here and talk about uh, film editing back in the day, but that's not me. I've never cut film, right? It's always been a, a computer. It's always been a program. So anybody can sit down and download Adobe Premiere or Avid Media Composer and sit there and put clips next to each other. That's fine. You might be an editor at that point, just putting things next to each other. But for me, what influences those moves is your life experience. Um, heartache, love, adventure, going to a show, getting drunk, like waking up hungover, doing drugs, having, having the time of your life, having the worst time of your life. The only way you're going to be able to tell a story and feel the emotion of the characters that you're in is if you also know how to draw upon that. So that's one thing that I've always told everybody editorial for me is less about me sitting behind the computer and it's everything else that I do in my life. Wow. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty awesome, man. I, yeah, that was a deep answer. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That was a big old spiral. You know, but, something yeah. else that separates you from these other folks is you is, I, I always thought this was a bold choice, but you only edit, using iMovie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just migrated to iMovie. I, I, for the longest time, it, my, it was Windows Movie Maker. Ah, so yes. I, I'm really excited to, to use all of the, um, the new features in iMovie. Dude, iMovie? I don't, I, don't use the, I don't use the latest version. I used one from about 10 years ago. Yeah, that's the one I have too, man. I, I love <laughs> the way that you can click like black and white and it makes the movie black and white it's pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny tell me i mean you've you've told me this once but this 
the podcast doesn't know about that. So t- tell me <laughs> about uh, like beginning the old post house. Tell me about how you like fucking all you you own a pro- post production company. How did that happen? Yeah, so I, I guess a quick kind of spark like just kind of uh, background on me is um, so being a musician that led me to uh, when I was going to community college in town here in Metro Detroit, kind of trying to still figure out what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a lawyer. I thought of maybe I would go into finance or something because that's what my brother did. I had no idea. But uh, at the same time, one of my friends, one of my good friends was uh, a photographer and him and I during our early college years, him and I both wanted I don't know. We just wanted like a little uh, studio space or something like that. And so we found this little hole in the wall space up in uh, Rochester, Michigan. So you can Google that for anybody that's not from Michigan. Um, kind of a weird place for us to do that. And But we found this little hole in the wall spot that the in front of the space was uh, a pizza shop. And the guy that owned the whole building, he was renting out that back space for only 500 bucks a month. So my friend and I, we were like, you know, we could probably figure this out. He wanted to use it for photography. I wanted to use it for like playing music and stuff. But then we were like, how are we going to pay the rent on this? Well, I was like, you know what? We could start throwing some shows, like maybe just like little cheap shows. We charge five bucks a head, five dollar cover. We can pay our rent. Fast forward. So we did that for two years and it ended up turning into like a little uh, music venue, an all ages music venue. I was about 18, 19, 20 years old. From that stand, from that point, that that really kind of like um, did a lot for me mentally. It was like, wait a minute, there's growing up in Metro Detroit, I never thought uh, a creative field was an actual career. Um, you're kind of always thought that you have to do something probably pretty fucking boring. Um, but that kind of opened my eyes. It was like, you know, maybe we could do something else. And fortunately, through that process of running the venue, we met some great people along the way that started to recognize our kind of like our output, our talents. Um, We were making videos for uh, projectors that we had in our venue. And a lot of people started to recognize that, like, hey, what's that content? We're like, oh, we're we're making it. Um, And so then we started to get hired to make video content for other bands, then all of a sudden for clients and commercial things. And then from that point, um, with a few guys in town here in Detroit, uh, started a production production company called The Work Inc. Ran that for about 10 years. Um, after that, uh, that was about three and a half years ago that we uh, decided to end that company and kind of all go our separate ways because at that point we were all kind of had figured out like what we each could do. And so through my time at The Work Inc., I had found that I love editorial. I was the computer nerd. I was kind of the IT guy and I was running all the post stuff inside of that production company. So it just it was just natural for me to move into is like well I, the only thing that I know how to do next is I think I could probably start a little boutique post house here in Detroit, and so that is my current company hiatus and so yeah we do commercial music videos short films that kind of stuff um, and I I had cut a uh, a documentary feature in the past but I'd never done a narrative feature so we need to do something is my first narrative feature that I, I I felt like I was ready but I was still questioning a lot of the things right I mean it was just like what am I doing how do I do this but again at the end of the day I trusted my gut I trusted emotion I trusted just kind of what the the story and the footage was telling me to do too so yeah that kind of catches us up to to now how did you get roped into doing the movie? Like, how did you meet Sean and everybody at Atlas? And how did this even happen? Yeah, so Sean, Sean, Bill, and I had um, kind of come across each other's way. I had known about Atlas Industries in town, and I think they had known of myself and my brother, who runs a production company in town here. Just, just I mean, Detroit's a small town, and there's only so many filmmakers and production companies and stuff. We'd all know any, like known of each other, but we never met. Um, so the beginning of 2020, we had started kind of working on a pitch for some other projects. And some of those didn't work out. They kind of fell through. And last summer, um, so the summer of 2020, uh, Sean and Bill were both like, do you think you want to cut like a horror film? I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Um, they're like, okay, cool. Well, we're going to send you the script. At that point, I was like, that's the literally the first feature script that's ever been sent to me, other than maybe like some of my friends had been writing some, right? 
But that was the first, like, in my world that was, like, an official, like, holy shit, somebody's sending me, like, a script for a movie to read. Dude, I read that thing instantly that night that they sent it to me. And I will never forget getting to page somewhere, whatever it was, 35 to page 50. I'm not going to drop it in terms of a spoiler or whatever. But there's a drop in, in, in that script in your book, in the movie, that I legitimately jumped and screamed out loud it spooked me it spooked me so much and i will never forget texting sean immediately after that and i was like holy fucking shit i'm in i don't care what the rest of this movie is like (laughs) i totally want to do this with you guys and he laughed and he he responded and he was like dude i i said the same thing like at the exact same page marker where i was like what the fuck is this fucking thing <laughs> so that was really where where it began i think it was probably last july and yeah. then once i told him i was like i'm interested he's like okay well just sit tight we gotta like find financing and all that shit and then so i think it was pretty not too long after maybe a month or so and then like he had texted me he's like we're greenland i was like what yeah, I don't even know what that means now. Yeah, we got greenlit like uh, a week into August, I think. Well, maybe a couple yeah. of weeks in August. Yeah, because I had I had put my uh, two weeks in at the so literally week. only a year ago. It's like yeah. it's exactly a year ago now, which is crazy. Yeah, I put my two weeks in at the hotel like halfway through August, and a week after I put my two weeks in, we got greenlit like exactly a week. amazing timing and you know and i think it was just again like the whole timing of shooting a horror film in october in metro detroit i mean you were here max like the fall season the colors the temperature the sun going down early like everything about it just felt right it was beautiful man the trees looked so i haven't seen trees like that since i grew up in indiana we all have trees like that in texas they were amazing. They were so beautiful yeah. and multicolored. And plus, you had geese that would just attack you. <laughs> Our Canadian geese. Yeah. Yeah. They great. they like they like ganged up in the the parking lot between the hotel and the movie set, and you had to like That's walk right. around them, or they would just come at you. That's right. And it was nothing but uh, geese shit just all over that parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're mean. I don't like them. Yeah, I did. I did take one home with me. <laughs> Dead or alive? Uh, I don't know if I would go to jail for telling you the truth, <laughs> so I'll just say dead. Perfect. Like compiling what you did on this movie to the stuff you were doing beforehand. Like how? Like what are the differences between like editing a spooky genre movie and like a documentary? I imagine you have a oh. shit ton of mill footage to go through in a doc. Yeah, documentaries. Um, there's a lot of figuring out that you're writing. You're writing the story in editorial most of the time, and and a lot of my prior work was just commercial based. So working with other like advertising agencies and clients and stuff. This this process was, and I'll like props and kudos to fucking Sean and the whole like everybody, like especially Sean and you, where you guys like really allowed me to bring my ideas to it. And I I remember the whole month before production started, all I was doing was rewatching all of my favorite horror films, taking notes, looking at things like reading other horror film scripts and, and then also reading those scripts while watching the films to see how that changed. Like what, like like what what movies? Um, and, and maybe I, if you recall any like change scripts that jumped out at you as you've been watching, that would be cool to talk. Well, about. they're all, they're all a little different, right? So my one, I, I mean, it probably sounds cliche, but favorite horror movie of all time is the shining, right? My, I love the shining, but I also love nightmare on Elm street. I love nightmare on Elm street because of the comedy aspect and the goofiness and the silliness and that whole franchise, the shining. I just love from the fucking standpoint of Stanley Kubrick is a, perfect genius um but also stephen king is a fantastic writer but to me i'm just like i was comparing what ended up happening and the changes that were made i i I can't remember anything sticking out to me right now like i even remember i would go through like even even just ari aster stuff and like hereditary and all of that stuff um big fan of like the witch like so many of those things are like new and old 
all I was doing was absorbing all types of horror films in September of last year, leading up to production of this film. And what I was doing during that, that those watch sessions, I was taking notes of like what I, what I liked from an editorial standpoint, um, but what I also like that I felt like I wanted to include in our film from an inspiration standpoint. And the reason I, I, I say that is because one of the one of the first things that Sean had told me getting into this thing, he was like, "I want this to become a." cult classic and i laughed i was like oh okay so like no. <laughs> so it was like no big deal here right like i i don't have to like uh that's easy that's just like an easy fucking thing but i will say like the from the um to his credit like the stand like to me my idea of what a director is is he is the leader right so whether or not he ever thought this was going to be a cult classic which i think he did but still, it was like, I, this is what, this is our goal. And this is like the, this is the bar we're setting with this thing. So for me, I wanted, again, me being a horror fan from a child, I, I really, really, really never wanted, I'm, I'm a huge fan of timelessness. I'm not a fan of fads. So to me, I was watching films that are timeless in nature. Um, and I wanted to wrap my head around what are the moves that I'm going to make that if we were to watch this thing five years, 10 years, 25 years from now, it will still hold up in the sense of, well, that wasn't some stupid gimmick or fad, like editorial style or trickery or some bullshit. Right. I wanted to make sure that what we were doing, because I, I knew like the importance of what I had control of in the edit room as soon as that trust was built with you and Sean, it was like, I, there's a lot of control that I have there than to present you guys with ideas that are like, yeah, this is good. So I wanted to make sure that it was like the best version of my idea. Yeah. I think the movie is mostly pretty timeless. I think we do a good job of like getting rid of cell phones pretty quickly in it. Totally, totally. And plus, it might become even more like appropriate, like in the future, with like the planet like dying and weather getting more extreme. We're gonna have sure. tornadoes and and fucking yeah. I don't know, we're already up, yeah. we're already in the apocalypse now. So yeah. that's. Uh... <laughs> I mean, the most unrealistic pill of this movie is the fact that the bathroom door opens outside. <laughs> What's with those lack of windows, too, right, Shane? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. How can they not get out of this thing? Uh -huh. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to see the movie. It's all, it's <laughs> almost like the, the how doesn't really meddle. I and mean, what meddles is it, what's going on inside. Absolutely. Yeah. Which I think we do a really good job of like right away. And that was one thing, though. I, I think between the, the few of us talking about it, obviously from your your uh, your book already – but then even talking about it in the film setting where it's like knowing who's going to be watching this and like the whole notion of like, we wanted to like delete that thought pretty quickly that people are going to be the whole time. Like, why the fuck can't they get out of here? <laughs> right? Yeah. It was like, well, we, we, we kind of explained it um, a couple times. So just fucking forget about that. Let's talk about other things. Yeah. That's not what the movie's about. It's a, exactly. <laughs> I know like a lot of this movie is difficult to really get into a lot of details about the editing because it might require uh, spoiling some stuff. But I, um, one of the scenes I think is like the best scene in the movie and it's all because of what you did with the editing. I don't think it would spoil too much. It's in like the films, what 20 minutes is when, um, um, Melissa begins like kind of um, hallucinating, daydreaming about Amy, who is uh, Melissa's girlfriend, and both of them are in the tub together. And you do some really fucking crazy editing with this that makes it so dreamy and just like, I don't know, like romantic. I was hoping you could just kind of talk about how that whole process happened, because I know there were some interesting uh, tidbits about that one. Yeah, I, I and, and so that was... Um... Outside of like the kind of like standard dialogue scenes and some of our scary moments, which we always try to stay away from like jump scares, but that's, that's back to your script. There was never, we never did like just stupid cheap jump scares, right? Like this thing's spooky and it's dark and it's ominous and it's just creepy from its own standpoint. Um, so all of those things 
those are like the more I, I would say kind of like I don't even want to say standard, but just like, I don't know, kind of classic ways that I was cutting stuff. Um, whereas getting into Melissa's hallucination um, and her flashbacks and some of these things where she's kind of just experiencing just things in her own way, uh, I really wanted to kind of give that its own feeling. The, a lot of the ways that I was able to kind of make like the dreamy stuff work, it, it stemmed and started from JP our director of photography in the way that um, he actually captured those moments and shot. And he changed the glass into like, this dreamy dream lens. Um, and it, it was this really, really soft, shallow depth of field. Uh, and so it created this really just creamy, dreamy, blurry kind of feeling. And so I, I was really inspired by that. I was obviously I'm extremely inspired by the performances that we got out of um, Sierra and Lisette. And so really from there, I, I also just was feeling like we could take something here and really lean into this kind of dream haze thing. And again, this kind of goes back to my my statement and comment on everything that I do in editorials drawn on my own life experiences and things like that. Whereas like, how would I feel not that I've ever, whatever, been stuck in a bathroom with my family like this, but I, I, again, I could put myself in a, in a, in a mindset of like, how would I feel if, um, I'm starting to kind of hallucinate or I'm starting to trip out. And that's kind of what I drew on from there. Um, I have done a lot of artistic kind of conceptual type of editorial stuff. I, I do a lot of tricks and shit and a lot of my music video edits. I do a lot of glitch edits. That's one thing I'm, I am a little bit known for with some of like that other creative stuff that I make. So this, these moments in this film allowed me to kind of bring a little bit of me into it. And I think that's where that comes from. Um, from a specific process standpoint, it, it's just a lot of my own little special trickery in in the software, to be honest. And uh, do you want to talk about the, uh, the, the, the light that you kind of took advantage of in that scene? Oh yeah. So to that point, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm used to getting footage that has to be reworked or kind of concepted in different ways, and it might not have been captured specifically for a certain thing. Um, and so what I mean by that is I'm used to grabbing like head frames and tail frames or like accidental rolls or like false take rolls and things like that of just weird shit. And to me, I watch everything. I watch every frame of everything that it comes in, which every editor should. But um, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot that you can overlook if, in an accident. And so I love those accidents. And so there was a there was a shot that I think they accidentally rolled on just some lights, and there was out of focus lights. They were just like this nice bokeh, and like all of this like weird shit happening. And that's, I literally looked at that and that told me what to do. And so that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I mostly let the footage tell me what to do. And then I just draw on my own experience to kind of create that feeling. That's awesome. Now, this may be like the same response you gave for the last question, but um, like you get a lot of different takes from each scene. You get different camera angles, you get different takes. When you're going through all this together, like how do you like, decide like this is the one of something else because sometimes i sometimes i think it might be easy because they're all of the takes except one might be shit but sometimes you get a bunch of good ones like how do you navigate this you know so i mean there's books and there's way better editors than myself out there that can explain uh the basics of editing and how to edit the right way um, so I'm not going to try to recreate any of that, but for me specifically on this film, um, after reading a ton and watching a ton and really figuring out how I was going to move on this, it, it comes down to performance, you know, like it, it really truly comes down to what is the best, um, take from the actor. What is the, the strongest, the most emotional, the most impactful. And I think even specifically for our film which I kind of toss back to you on this is like, and which why I was so, so incredibly like stoked to have you in the edit room with me was 
a lot sometimes choosing those takes where it's like whatever the craziest one was is the one we're gonna fucking start with. So especially especially with Pat Healy, um, anything <laughs> like we would go through the takes and let's say there's six takes, whatever the number is. There was usually one that stood out. You're like, that is fucking insane where we're going to start there. And I, again, I, I, I really give you credit to that. Like it was really awesome for me in this first kind of uh, experience sitting in the room with you. Like it's your script, it's your book, it's your story. These are your characters. And, but then if Pat or any of the actors uh, took it in their own way. You're like, no, 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 no. Let's fucking go with that. Like that is way better than what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's multiple in, uh, times in this movie where like what they're saying is not in the script, and like I remember being present not in the and, book, that, and that and that yeah, anything. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a scene where uh, Pat Healy just kind of snaps at his uh, his uh, Donald, like explaining why they can't break out, and none of that dialogue is anything I wrote. He just he just kind of improved on it and it was awesome. And I think to that, that's, that's why a, a common thread here and everything that I discuss about this film is I give so much credit to you and Sean for your openness and us, all, all of us collaborating on this of like, we all went into this to have some fun. We all went into this to like, let's make a fucking wild ass horror film. Um, we already we know we have a really fun ass story, fun ass script, and it's like how can we just like push that? And so I think that's that's where it came from, like how I would select takes and stuff, like that um, energy that I was kind of provided by you guys. Every move that I made from a, a shot selection or anything, it was like, what's what is going to be the move here that's going to push this thing over the fucking top? Yeah. Now, so. while doing this, do you do you have any like pressure at all? Like, oh man, I I hope Sean likes this 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 take I chose. Um. Yeah, I think you always have that. Yeah. But uh, pretty pretty early on, um, a director and editor, the only way that they'll ever be able to make anything together is trust, right? And so pretty pretty early on, uh, I think. And I, I, I will say this, this actually stems back to some of the, the, um, the little projects that I was working on with Sean prior to this film. I think he, he, he already, him, him and I had already kind of built a little bit of a trust together. Um, and then I think after the first few days on set and after me putting stuff together, um, it was pretty evident that him and I were thinking the exact same way. And and at that point, he kind of gave me full reign to just go. There were only a handful of times that I ever remember him coming back. And it wasn't even the standpoint of him questioning the, the, the take that I chose. It was, why don't we just look at something else to play with it? Yeah. And which I'm always down with. Editorial is playtime, right? Like, <laughs> it, it seriously is. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You saying You're that, uh, it brings <laughs> to mind a memory of us. Uh, I won't say, I won't go into all the details, but there was a, there was a really pleasant memory in my uh, brain of us um, piecing together a, a really comedic <laughs> montage in the movie <laughs> of, uh, with a famous yeah. song. And oh, not only do we like make this montage, but we also like we were listening to the lyrics and making the actions of the kill tools match what was going on in the song. And we spent, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Am you I, and I, and I'm going <laughs> to add to this, you and I were beyond confident that we had made the <laughs> coolest fucking thing ever. And we were so excited to show Sean and at the end of the shoot day. And I think like you, like you and I were both just like, this is fucking it. Like, this is like the best thing ever. And then this is, and, and honestly, like Sean's response to that, not as hype as we were was like, Okay, maybe we need to get out of this fucking room. <laughs> so, we were so excited. I recall, like, 
anytime we would make a new like change to the montage, we would both like stand up because we couldn't like confine the excitement we had about this. We would pace <laughs> around the room just like, yeah. yes, yes. And yeah. then I recall I was standing outside of the editing room when Sean walked in that night and he looked at me and he said, whoa, you have a strange energy right now. <laughs> yeah, you could feel the, the energy that you and I had being in that room all day long. Oh my goodness. You know, I, I'm, I mean, I don't mean to like pivot this, but this just, this does make me think of something I did want to talk about um, yeah. in, in uh, the kind of process of this film, which is super weird, is the standpoint of how we did this and how I was on set and how this whole kind of like process, like of me editing on set actually went down, right? Yeah, because it's like, usually, I mean, it's called post-production. It's usually actual <laughs> filming wraps. <laughs> right. That's, that's in the name of it, Right. Um, granted, I mean, there's there's editors on sets for a handful of movies. I know, like, Edgar Wright and things like that. Like, his editor will be on set, and they're kind of cutting shit together. Um, it's not it's not an unheard of thing. Um, but it is, it's it's not, like, overly common. Um, and so th- th- the reason I think this happened was, again, our, our our team was small. Our budget was small. And and then also the timeline and the time frame in which um, Sean and the, the producers and everybody wanted to get this thing done was really tight. And so originally our deadline was um, we were starting in production at the end of September and they wanted to have like final cut, final lock by December 31st. That's three fucking months, including the month of production. Um, granted, I'm used to psycho timelines from my commercial background so when he asked me that up front it was like is this doable i'm like yeah sure <laughs> i mean even not knowing anything that i was doing i was like yeah i could fucking get that done by then and so i was extremely excited to obviously just be on set anyway so the notion of cutting on set i was like hell yeah this sounds fucking awesome well little did i know there wasn't a whole uh team that was supporting me during that and so what i what i mean by that is um typically on a on a production you're you have what's called a dit the digital imaging technician so the dit takes the footage from camera at the end of the night and they'll transcode it which means compressing it to smaller files um and then also creating dailies like a daily sequence and a daily sequence of that is everything that was shot in that day and then that's sent to the producers um, by the next morning for everybody to look at what was shot the previous day, right? Cool. And then I didn't know we didn't have that. Um, so <laughs> within the first few days of production, like first day or two of production, it was like, holy shit, I have to do that. And then also figure out how to edit during the day. So I loved it. I was so like um, mentally tuned up and prepped for this process. Like as soon as I was realized, it was like, holy fuck, this is what I'm getting into. I was like, whatever, this is it. So my, my schedule for like those three and a half weeks, I would work about um, eight, 9 a.m. Um, until about three or 4 a.m. Every, every day. So I was getting about three or four hours of sleep. And let me explain what that day looked like. So um, they would start their production um, start filming, whatever, 8, 9, 10, 11 a.m. And throughout the day, um, they're running up like the media to me, like the cards of the footage where I would have to offload that footage to a hard drive. And then I would process that, like transcode it. So it was editable for me on set there. So during that, I was also editing the film. <laughs> so what I quickly figured out in this insane flow, which you can actually find on my Instagram, there's documentation of what this process looked like, um, is I, I figured out that I would edit, um, as soon as I got in in the morning, I would edit um, kind of morning, afternoon, up until they wrapped. And then let's say they're wrapping between 6 and 9 p.m. at night. And then at that point, then I would do all of my kind of like IT, DIT um, kind of role. So like offloading the cards, making sure the hard drives are backed up, getting myself prepped to edit the next day. That's insane. So what I was able to do, and it was a challenge to myself, um, not to anybody else, but it was just some psycho challenge that I 
created for myself was I always wanted to try to stay up with production, meaning the previous day that they shot, I wanted to be able to edit that all within that next day. So then by the time I got new footage, then I could edit, process that that night, and then come in the next morning and edit that stuff. Uh, pretty much I was able to stay up on top of that other than a handful of scenes. And what I mean by editing that, more so rough cut stuff. Because at the end of the shoot days, Sean and the DP, JP would come up and would kind of want to see what I was working on. The cool thing about this process was we were able to pivot on some things that like, oh shit, uh, maybe we want to recapture something or maybe we want to add in a new shot because, hey, that scene, we wanted to just do something a little different. Yeah, like we could see like, oh, actually, we need a transition between these two scenes. Exactly. Yeah, and it was really fucking fun and like alive, right? We were active in, we were able to see the movie come together while they were shooting it. And like, that was just so fucking fun. So then we were able to pivot. So really, it was only a handful of days that some of the scenes took obviously a lot longer and it was, they were a lot harder for me to kind of put together. And again, this was all more so just like rough cut stuff. But um, for, the, for the most part, it was only, I think, I had given myself a psycho deadline of I wanted a week after production to have a full rough cut of the film done. And I think we hit that pretty much. Granted, that rough cut was like two and a half hours long. <laughs> um, granted, where the end, the movie ends up now is I think we're at like an hour and a half, 137 or something like that. Yeah. But it was still pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> it was like two and a half hours long. Yeah. And we were and we were like, oh, this is great. We don't need to cut this down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't honestly, I don't even remember that version, which is an also an amazing like learning uh i think lesson from this whole thing is like i think you and i and maybe even sean a little bit but sean sean is more well versed in this than you and i were i think there was probably some versions that like we're sitting at two hours and we're like there's no way we can cut anything <laughs> yeah um trying to think now i don't think we actually deleted any like scenes completely i think it's just like bits and pieces cut, cutting heel and veil right like totally. i don't think we're missing totally. a scene from the movie I don't know. We're not. No. And that was the thing, though, too. I give a lot of credit to you guys. You guys had pre-edited this movie. Mm -hmm. You guys going into production knew your limitations of like how many shoot days you had. And I know you guys put a lot into pre-pro and like really locking that script down. Whereas like I didn't have to figure out like reordering things or like trying to figure out the structure of the fucking thing. Like you guys had the roadmap built for me. So it made my job a lot easier. I wasn't trying to like rebuild a story, um, which a lot of times I do. Whereas this was like, you guys had that structure built, which I think really truly comes from you. Like it's your novella turned into a script and it's like, this is the flow of the story. So yeah, um, um, I'll, I'll say that we did uh, Sean and uh, Ryan Lewis uh, produce on the movie. We spent a lot of time, uh, tweaking the script a little bit before we did anything else. Like I know the uh, the structural of how things happened. It did change over time. Like there was this scene in the movie, the final movie, till I don't know what what point, but like after the second that after the halfway milk, really shit ton of things happen at once in a really like suspenseful uh the time. Like it's it's. It happens so fast that you think, okay, nothing else can happen right now because I'm going to have a health <laughs> attack. But then something else yeah. happens. And originally, I mean, the way it was written, they they will spread out more and, and they happen differently. Like some like one thing happened before something else. But over yeah. time, it just made so much more sense to kind of have those things happen one after the other for this truly like chaotic fucking madness totally. and i think that's i think the part the parts that you're talking about is like one of the biggest like sections for me when we were in, during in production that it was like i don't know how to figure this out this quickly right now like there's so much happening like i just kind of have to cook through this and try to like rough it in and skeleton this thing in so we can kind of see it put together but like yeah i think I think we're talking about a similar section. I don't want to give anything away or talk about like what we're talking about. <laughs> but um, it's the I, section that begins with something that we both couldn't keep watching. Yes, yeah. exactly. Which that part, maybe one day we'll do another podcast after people have seen the thing. But 
there were a lot of um, edit decisions during that section that <laughs> I remember being in the room with you, you had to get up and leave. And it was, it was awful. Um, but I also remember there was a lot of that, that section that we're talking about that everybody listening to this right now is like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> um, there's a section in there that is heavily influenced, I would say, by The Shining in that moment, even from the standpoint of the score. And there's only one jump cut in this entire film. And what a jump cut is, is like, I never ever want to just like, you see, uh, let's say for in this, I'm going to give a little bit away a hand and then jump in to that same shot of a hand, but closer. This, this section for me was the moment I had banked all of these, like um, just kind of editorial ideas, thoughts and moves and whatever tricks and stuff where I was like, I want to use a jump cut in this film. And I, I, I know exactly where to put it. And there's a, there's a sonic cue too with the score that David Chapdelaine our composer um, perfectly synced up with me on that, which makes it a hell of a lot spookier. And for anyone who wants to like know more about the editing of that specific scene and how uh, Shane, uh, Shane and I reacted to it, go pick up the, the DVD slash Blu-ray because we recorded a commentary track and we talked oh, yeah. about that specifically. Oh yeah. And how much it fucked us up. <laughs> I'm assuming when this episode uh, goes live, um, mill details about the Blu-ray will be available. I don't know That's at good. this point. Uh, the episode will come out sometime in September, uh, so let's hope <laughs> I can just link to the DVD. That'd be great. Beep, 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 beep. This just in from Max in the future. As of the time that this episode of the podcast is released, still no news about that Blu-ray, although I am told it is definitely happening someday. I don't know when. It's not up to me. But we, we did recall the commentary track. And eventually, I assume it will be available to buy. I have no other news. Okay. Back to the podcast. I mean, you, this is the first uh, movie you've edited, like espe and especially in a genre that you love. Like, did you like learn any lessons that you didn't know going in that you want to bring to the table on the next movie you edit? It's a good question. You know, I think for me on this one, I had no expectations of what it was going to be and what it was um, kind of like what I was getting into. I I just felt like I could really trust the team that I was a part of that the one thing that I was confident about is that I know, I know, I know performance. I trust my taste level and my gut in the sense of like what I think is a good take or a bad take. Um, I'm, I'm also at the end of the day, like I, I shoot my like still photography. So I'm always thinking about what, what is even the DP going to love from a frame standpoint. I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about the actors. I'm thinking about you as the writer. I'm thinking about Sean as the director. I'm thinking about, all of these components that that we're all gonna walk away from and be like, I fucking stand by this. This is like one of the best things that this is like, I'm extremely fucking proud of what we made. I think for me coming out of this one, I mean, I don't mean to sound like a fucking asshole, but I don't know if there's anything specific coming out of this that I would take into the next <laughs> one because I feel like every project is so unique. So it's really hard yeah. to say, like, I, I love, um, and I'm used to a ton, tons of different types of projects and I prepare for every single one that comes across my desk in the sense of like, I can't anticipate what the next one's going to be. But then as soon as I, if I get a brief or a script or a board or something, as soon as I'm sent that, I think that just comes naturally because I'm an editor. I'm, I'm not usually a part of the initial concept phase. I'm usually brought in, in a phase where people are like, hey, here's this thing I want to make. How do we do it? And I'm like, okay, I'll give you an opinion because now, you're, you, now you've given me something to kind of react to. I think, I, I guess if there's anything I will say is, um, it's my fucking mantra is just trust in, trust in my gut and in everything. I'm, I think the testament to, like even the, the, like this film, like 
making it with you guys and where we thought this was going to go. And we were even, we knew we were like making something really fun and different and unique. But at the end of the day, if if it just ended like self distribution VOD, we were all happy with it. And I think where it's gone is um, a little bit of a testament to our thoughts and our tastes and like the things that we, we, we thought were good, but we also made a, might've been like, well, I don't know if, or other people are going to like this. So it was really cool. I think hearing like the Tribeca thing, like that fucked me up, like in a, in an, an insane way. Right. Cause I, I mean, I still to this day, and I think you could probably agree. We're like, how the fuck did this thing make it to Tribeca? But I was like, but I, but I also, I, I understand it. Like we, we re- there's a lot of passion in this film, not even just from our, us, but from the actors, from the whole crew, like, every single person that was involved in the making of this, like really had to kind of go out of their way to make it. <laughs> and yeah, I really cared about it. Like even, even down to the standpoint of me bringing in um, David, the composer, like he, he was brought in pretty, pretty late. And um, this is his first movie. He's never scored a movie and he's not, I would say necessarily like horror is his genre. And I think wow. like, okay. um, yeah, so this is a, this is a segue into your, uh, your episode with David regarding the score, but like, I'll let you guys discuss that. But like David and I, like the quick background on that is David and I've been working together for about six or seven years. He's originally from here um, in Detroit too. He lives in LA now and he's one of the most talented people I've ever met. He's such a brilliant musician, but I, I knew right away when we were like, seeking um a composer and a musician that was gonna like really make this their own but then truly understand i guess just the the complexity of it the weirdness of it like the 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 whole like notion that we could make whatever the fuck we wanted to make like i knew it was going to be david and i think that's like a whole testament to everybody involved in this film where it was like just have fucking fun with it go with it Um, we all kind of agreed with each other, but it was also we let each other do what each did, right? Yeah, you know, I don't, I, I haven't told you this, but since we're talking about David, it's funny. Um, I have a friend who also does music and shit, and I, I, at the time when we were looking for someone, I kind of thought, well, maybe we can consider this guy. We never really did, but I, I, sh- I sent you some of his music. Yeah, no, he's great. Yeah, he's awesome. I remember that recently he, uh, he watched the movie again with like the actual soundtrack. He messaged me. He was like, it's not easy for me to admit this, but the soundtrack rocks. (laughs) (laughs) He loved it. You know, and, and again, I'm not going to get in too much of the soundtrack or the score in this episode here, because that's, I think for another episode, but, um, it was, it was pretty, pretty evident early on where it was like, when you and I were talking and even you, Sean and I were talking, I was like, well, we know what this movie is and what it can be. And it's like, we want this fucking score to be this fucking art house score that like, I can't fucking wait for this to be on Spotify so I can listen to it every day. And that's where I knew David, David was the right guy. We knew we wanted to do something weird. We knew we wanted to do, um, I don't think we necessarily knew we wanted to do like a metal influenced score, but I think that, um, I think as soon as that idea kind of came up, um, we were like, fuck it, let's try it out. And then David demoed. And literally the funny thing about a lot of his um, demos and V1s, um, that's what's in the movie. Like we didn't change a whole lot. So I love that school, man. I, I, I just have the, the MP3 tracks. And I just Me listen too. to it as I write now. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And- he wrote so much music too. There's so many tracks. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like a 55 minute album. Yeah, I think there's like 25 to 30 <laughs> songs or something. It's insane. Yeah, uh, for folks listening, uh, stay tuned. Soon enough, there will be an episode out with David talking about the music. Um, That'll be fun. Hell yeah. It's not like a specific memory of being on set that like you think of the most. Like that was that was cool. When I when I think about like you and I together and like the stuff that we did, I, I really like the 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 time that sean kind of called us both down to be on set to like watch a take and then like sean was like was that good he like yeah no that's that's a fucking awesome point because i think and that was probably a little bit more more than halfway 
more than halfway through production because I think by that point we obviously had a decent amount, whatever, half of the film cut. <laughs> because there was one thing I didn't bring up. It was like we basically shot this movie in chronological order. So then I was able to edit it in chronological order of like how the, the film is put together. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's a really that's a really awesome point there. It's like I think there were a handful of times that Sean wanted us to be down there. So then even if we were only down there for like five minutes, ten minutes. So they could roll on a take and then look over, look over to Shane and Max and go, yeah. And you're like, nah, why don't we try something like this? <laughs> yeah, didn't we, didn't we give like an acting direction for Pat? Healy? We did. We How did. amazing is so that? About, I felt so weird about it. I was like, we're not allowed to do this. But again, <laughs> that's fucking Sean. Sean's yeah. a fucking badass. I love that motherfucker. Sean yeah, understands he... that the filmmaking is just a collaboration. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's the only way this movie got put together. It was it was the whole collaboration of everybody involved, and plus all that money. Um, how can, <laughs> how can right. folks find? Like, do you? I mean, I know you have Instagram, so like, you did talk I about do. like how you were documenting that. So, how can folks find I, you on yeah. Instagram? Uh, my Insta is just Shane P Ford, um, but yeah, I have a whole little uh, highlight uh, thing, whatever the fuck that means, but like a story highlight on my page that um honestly like oddly and not oddly just uh, whatever like just like nostalgic for me is like i like to go back through and look at it because literally the first post on that highlight on my page is it says day one <laughs> and it's, it's it's a photo of me after i just set up the uh the computer that i was going to edit the movie on oh, nice. um so it's it's really it's really nostalgic for me looking at that now but again i uh when when we were involved in that process i i made sure that every day and all day long i was like pinching myself of going this is one of the, this is absolutely the coolest fucking thing you'll ever do <laughs> and so like now that i look back at that i'm like thank god like um, I documented it and, um, I never took it for granted. And that's where I was like, I'm super fortunate to have met all of you guys. And it's like, obviously the friendship that you and I have kind of like formed since then, it's just been great knowing that there's another fucking lunatic out there in the world. <laughs> And that was my conversation with Shane Patrick Field. Hit him up at Hiatus. He has cool stuff. Go to his social media uh, profiles. I'm sure he told us in the out in the end of the episode. I I don't know. I recalled his outro before I even edit the podcast. It's possible he said them. If not, just Google Shane Patrick Field Hiatus. You should find it. I hope you check out the movie. We need to do something. It's it's a movie. And support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Leave a review of the podcast on iTunes. Give Ghoulish some love. It needs love and attention. Because I'm lonely and sad and depressed. And I don't have health insurance to get a therapist. Peace, Max!